Hi, everybody. Good, uh, good afternoon and good evening. We'll just wait one more minute until the room will be populated. Okay. Good afternoon and good evening. I'm Alon Confino. I am the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies at UMass. And I'm very happy to open another year together with uh, my colleague and friend Amos Goldberg, the director of the Abraham Herman Research Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University of uh, another year, our third year of the Encounters series, which brings together um, scholars who have written um, um, influential and excellent books uh, on uh, topics of our interests. This year, the subject is aftermath with an S at the end, a little bit difficult to pronounce. And our first book, our first conversation will be with Jeffrey Weidlinger, on his recent book, In the Midst of Civilized Europe, The Pogroms of 1918 to 1921 and the Onset of the Holocaust. Uh, I'd like um, first to give the word to Amos, who will say a few words, and then we will start. Amos, please. And thank you very much, Alon. Thank you for this uh, collaboration. I just want to say that I'm extremely happy about it. I think it's a very good project. And I think the two, except for what you said, and uh, I think the two main principles of this uh, encounter series, which already runs for the third year, is that we both come from Holocaust studies, but we want to integrate it in our discussions, in our book discussions into broader context, and to have a mixed audience that even though it's on a virtual platform, still I think the sensitivities that both audiences and both uh, institutions bring to these discussions are very important and essential. So I'm very, very happy uh, about uh, this uh, joint project and the collaboration. And um, I'm sure we will have great and interesting discussion on great and interesting books. And uh, I wish all who attend and Jeffrey and Alon and all those who will attend Shana Tova and Ktiva uh, Vechatima Tova. So, Thank you, Amos. Somehow skipping um, um, uh, things, I'd like to remind you that this event is uh, recorded and is gonna be available in the YouTube channel of the Institute. Also, you can follow us on Facebook. You can sign up for our, for our email list. Um, we have a new uh, fall 2022 program at the Institute. Paz will uh, circulate it among you if you wanna join our list just send him in the chat. Um, and our next event, our next event, you know, I don't remember what is our next event. We are gonna move directly to our current event. So I'm delighted to have Jeffrey Weidlinger with us, uh, professor at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Um, Jeffrey, thank you for your book. Looks like this in paperback, um, and I'd like I'd like us to begin. Maybe you can tell us what what brought you to write this this uh, this book. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, and thank you everybody for coming, and thank you Amos for uh, arranging this. I'm really pleased to be a part of this collaboration. Really looking forward to having a nice uh, chat with you, Alan. Um, so, what brought me to the book? I in 2002, so I guess about 20 years ago, I started to work with uh, my colleague Dov Bear Kurler, who is a Yiddish linguist, traveling through Ukraine, interviewing Yiddish speakers about their lives. And it was with a group of linguists. We were an international group of linguists and me. And uh, the idea was to trace the variations in the Yiddish language. And so they had a whole list of words that they would ask people in Russian, and they would ask for the Yiddish word. Um, we were looking for elderly Yiddish speakers, in, mostly in small towns in Ukraine. And there was a part of the interview 
uh, where they would move away from the pure linguistic part of the interview and just ask them about their lives and say, tell me about your life. Tell me about uh, your life before the war, during the war, and after the war. And I was struck by how many stories involved these pogroms, anti-Jewish acts of violence between 1918 and 1921. The oldest people that we interviewed were born right around 1914. So they were very young children um, in 1918, 1919. Um, we interviewed one person who I often talk about, Nisim Yurkovetsky uh, in the town of Tulchin. And he showed us a scar on his arm where as a child, he had, been, uh, he had been hit by a bullet that left a scar on his arm and the same bullet that killed his mother in a mass grave in 1919. And he was left uh, to die in this mass grave together with the rest of his family. And a Polish priest happened to be walking by a little bit later and found that the baby was still alive and took him out. Uh, so we were hearing stories like this that to me were just just remarkably uh, tragic and abhorrent. And I certainly knew about the pogroms of the Civil War, but it's not something I had ever given all that much thought to. Uh, it's not something that I had regarded as a real turning point in Jewish history. But when I heard people who had lived through both those pogroms and then 20 years later lived through the Holocaust in the same place, I started to think about them differently and to realize that they're connecting them they're portraying and they're talking about the Holocaust as simply the next wave of pogroms for them, the way that they experienced it. And I started to realize that this is a new way of thinking about them and that really they did have a tremendous impact. 100,000 people, 100,000 Jews were killed in 1918 to 1921. And that's an astronomical figure that if it weren't for the Holocaust 20 years later would be you know, the major turning point and the major tragedy uh, in Jewish history and was, was at the time and people who lived through it were still talking about it that way. So just kind of the realization that these survivors of the Holocaust and of the pogroms uh, were talking about them in the same breath made me recognize that it's something historians may not have fully emphasized as much as we should. Jeffrey, you told me in one of our conversations that when you started to write this book, which is your fourth, your fourth book, you had a blank screen. Mm -hmm. Other books, you have written articles beforehand, you thought about it. So how, how did you go about actually starting to collect materials from where, what kind of materials, uh, what kind of archives, perhaps spanning a few countries, different languages, if you can tell us something about that. Yeah, so it started when I, I, I was doing this uh, interview project when I was a professor at Indiana University, where I taught for 14 years before coming to Michigan. And soon after I came to Michigan, uh, I became a fellow at the Frankel Institute for Advanced Judaic Studies, uh, which was a fellowship year of no teaching to work on my own project. I later went on to direct that institute for six years, but this was before I was the director. Uh, I was a fellow there. And... I had imagined at that time a project that would look broader at the borderlands of Ukraine and its Jewish life in the borderlands and their experiences with violence over time. And those pogroms were just going to be one part of it. Um, I had just finished writing my other book, which told the story of Jewish life in Ukraine in the 20th century from the perspective of the people we interviewed. And that was a book that spanned a much larger period of time from 1919 through basically the 1950s. Uh, and I just finished that book and was interested now in taking that experience of violence and looking at how it compares to earlier bouts of violence, the 1881 pogroms, the 1903 to 1905 pogroms, uh, and the Holocaust and the 1918 to 1921 pogroms. And when I started writing it, when I sat down and got all of my sources together, uh, I just realized how immense uh, this one period of 1918 to 1921 is. And I realized it was going to take up a lot of my time and did in fact take up the next six years or so of my time. Jeffrey, I want to ask you about some of the main arguments you make in, in the book. But before, I want to tell our, our audience that um, after our conversation, there will be time for questions, of course. And please write your questions at the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. So what are some of the main, main arguments you put forward in, in the book? 
Yeah, so much of the book is about the pogroms itself, uh, trying to assess who the perpetrators of these pogroms were, why they perpetrated pogroms, and how those pogroms played out. Uh, so much of the book, about three quarters of the book, really focuses in detail, kind of micro studies of several individual pogroms that I've picked out and try to analyze exactly what was happening in them. And then another portion of the book looks at what happened afterwards, relating it to the Holocaust. And the main argument that you know, unites these chapters is to say that this is also a factor in the Holocaust that I think has been overlooked, the extent of violence that Jews experienced in Ukraine. Um, and to point out that Ukraine is where the very first mass murders of the Holocaust began uh, in June 1941. Um, when the Nazis began rounding up people and killing them. And in one of those very first pogroms, uh, the pogrom in Lviv uh, that the Nazis perpetrated and encouraged locals to participate in, the Nazis actually even called Petlura days, naming it after the Ukrainian head of state from the period of the 1919 pogrom, Simon Petlura. So the Nazis themselves were making this connection that what they are doing in Ukraine is a continuation of the pogroms of 1918 to 1921. Uh, that's not to say they're the only factor, of course, but I think it's an overlooked factor, just how much is a very short period of time, 20 years. In fact, when I think about it, I just said it's 20 years since I began this project, since I first started interviewing Yiddish speakers in Ukraine. To me, that seems like a flash in the pan. And uh, 20 years, the legacy of the pogroms 20 years later was still very much in play uh, at the time of the Holocaust. So I think we need to think of that connection. I'll say I do, I teach a course on the Holocaust and I just yesterday um, or a few days ago was dealing with violence in the interwar period. And I asked my students, they have multiple choice questions and they take a little eye clicker quiz where they pick the correct answer. And one of the questions was how many civilians were killed in state-sponsored violence between in the era of peace between the two wars? And I give a few choices, 500, 5,000, 50,000, 5 million, you know, about 5 million. And the answer is about 5 million when you factor in the famines, the Russian Civil War, even the Spanish Civil War. And that's an astronomical amount of violence that the Holocaust was building upon. And I think much of the conventional uh, interpretations that we have of the Holocaust is that it came out of the blue. The people were living peaceful, middle-class lives, as it's often told, and then suddenly Hitler came to power in 1933 and everything changed. And I just think it's important to show, as others have done as well, that in the build-up in that 20 years before the Holocaust, there was an unimaginable violence being perpetrated against Jews as well as against other people, uh, that the Holocaust emerged in a climate of violence in Eastern Europe that I don't think we have fully appreciated until recently was going to ask you about the Holocaust later, but now since yeah. we are speaking with this, I'm gonna, you convince me, but there is a but, because that the First World War has something to do with that the violence of the First World War mm -hmm. and the violence of the, inter, of, the, of the interwar years have something to do with the violence of the Holocaust. I think most historians would, would agree, but in your book, you argue for causal connection. You said the onset, the, the pogroms in Ukraine and the onset of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. In page nine, you say that the book traces the roots of the Holocaust. Yes, I think a lot of scholars of the Holocaust, not only of the Holocaust, will say, yeah, there are links of association, there are links of violence, there are links of memory, links of anti-Semitism. Uh, other scholars will say, well, the Holocaust was imagined and conceivable before it happened. A world without Jews was not created out of nothing. Um, but to say that there was a causal relation here, uh, I, I, I left unconvinced mm -hmm. um, in this, in this very strict historical analysis. All the other arguments I can 
I can see. Um, well, it depends if you you're, say? I mean, you know, I think, you know, perhaps you're confusing monocausal with causal, that I'm not claiming that it's the monocausal solution, I'm claiming, uh, uh, um, cause, I'm claiming that it is one of a multiplicity of causes, but I think we've, certain aspects of which we've underestimated. You're right that Holocaust, that Holocaust historians have long recognized that violence, you know, played a role in pre, uh, pre-Holocaust, pre pre-war violence against Jews played a role. Um, but I don't think they quite recognized the extent to which it had played a role. Um, in the same way that one could talk about the role of, uh, of you know, religious anti-Semitism, as you do in your, you know, excellent book. Um, it's not monocausal, but I think you were correct to point out that religious anti-Semitism, conventional anti-Semitism, we, we have underestimated the role that conventional anti-Semitism played um, in the Holocaust and the rise of the Nazis. I think I'm just making the same type of argument that we've underestimated the role that a few things played, that violence itself played, violence begets violence, and violence against Jews of the Civil War period made the violence against Jews of the Second World War period imaginable, that it escalates. One act makes the next one uh, imaginable more so. And I think, you know, an example that I've used to make that argument, you know, an analogy in just, you know, contemporary America would be school shootings that to me were inconceivable 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when I was in school, when I was in high school, the, the last thing that I ever thought of was somebody coming in with a gun and shooting people in the school. But once it's done, it becomes more regular. People become somehow accustomed to it. And now it's not so surprising anymore. And I know my children who have grown up in high schools in the United States think of it all the time. And I get texts from them in classrooms saying, I'm scared there's somebody strange in the hallway. Um, and so they imagine it as something that's conceivable and it makes it more possible to happen each time. So I think just that in and of itself, breaking that mental barrier between the inconceivable and the conceivable uh, is of integral importance. I think that when historians of the Holocaust or of Jews and anti-Semitism um, in the 20th uh, century see the Holocaust as conceivable and, and imaginable in historical terms, unlike a generation of historians, of course, a generation or two of, of historians who thought that it is unimaginable. So this is already progress, yeah. interpretative progress. <laughs> so I'd like, I'd like to take you to the events itself, themselves. And if you can tell us um, something about this violence within the context of the aftermath of the First World War, and why do you think the aftermath of the First World War uh, created such violence against Jews? That yeah. is not not violence in 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 the in the battlefield, but violence against civilians, and on such long and um, the stories that you tell in your book are are horrifying. Yeah. It's a, it's a tragic story for the Jews, and it's a tragic story for the Ukrainians, and it's a tragic story for the Russians and everybody and the Poles and everybody who is living in that area. Um, with the end of the war, the major empires that were ruling over that territory, the, Ru the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire as well, and the German Empire, all collapsed, leaving this big void, which became Ukraine, um, in the middle. And Ukraine had, had, had people who considered themselves Ukrainians living in many of those empires, and they now claimed independence, rightfully so. Um, Poles also claimed independence over similar territory, and two groups of Russians claimed independence. Russian nationalists claimed independence over the territory of Ukraine, and then another group of Soviets also claimed independence for the Soviet, for they were then going to call the Soviet Union over the same territory. So this one territory had four overlapping claims of independence on it uh, that was going to bring about some type of conflict between Poles, between Ukrainians, between Russian nationalists or old Russians and uh, this new Soviets, Soviet Russians, the Bolsheviks. And in the midst of that, 
were the Jews. The Jews weren't concentrated in any one particular territory in Ukraine. Instead, they were living scattered in urban areas and urban enclaves. So whereas Poles were concentrated in the West, for instance, uh, Russians were concentrated in the East, Jews were in both the West, the East, the Central, but always in these urban enclaves. So as the war began, everybody started to suspect the Jews. The Germans suspected the Jews of sympathizing with the Russians. The Russians suspected them of sympathizing with the Germans. The Ukrainians thought that they were on the Poles' side, and the Poles thought that they were on the Ukrainian side. And at the same time, the Bolsheviks initially attacked them on the grounds that Jews were capitalists, and they associated Jews with the urban middle class and with the traders that they so despised. But everybody else associated the Jews with the Bolsheviks. So regardless of which side you were on, it was possible to imagine that the Jews were to blame. And they became a victim of all sides uh, carried out atrocities against them. So Jeffrey, you, you mentioned correctly that the pogroms against the Jews within the context of the interwar violence was, was one, one part of five millions or so civilians. So how can we put this, these pogroms within a broader European, let's stay now within a European uh, context, with it, either of um, the creation of homogeneous nation states or of ethnic, uh, ethnically driven um, um, atrocities. Um, in, yeah. in, in what way was there, was there a, a European movement against civilians who didn't look like us. Yeah, it, it is part of a broader movement against those, against outsiders, against people who are regarded as outsiders, don't fit in with the new nation states that are being established. Uh, this happens in a particularly violent way in the territory of Ukraine, and Jews are the major minority, a major ethnic minority in that area. So they become victims for that reason. I don't think it's based on any particular long-standing anti-Semitism, any particular uh, long-standing revulsion against Jews, although that certainly exists. But it's a matter of historical circumstance that it is the Jews who are victims of this violence in this particular place. Uh, it draws upon, in committing the violence, they draw upon age-old anti-Semitic stereotypes and uh, and coded coded language. But I don't think that's the major cause. I think the cause is just the absolute chaos that is uh, inflicts Ukraine as a result of the collapse of these empires. Um, and I will say that you know it begins with a lot of hope. Uh, as the empires fall, a Ukrainian state is established, and the Ukrainian state promises broad autonomy to the Jews. It starts printing currency with uh, Yiddish language on it. It brings in a minister of Jewish affairs. It promises Jews full equality in the state, not only as individuals, like the type of equality the Jews had in, say, France and Britain, but it promises Jews as a nation national autonomy. So the right to continue to be a nation and to govern itself within the structure of a broader state. And this is celebrated by Jews around the world um, who flock to, uh, uh, to defend Ukraine and to side with and to and to side with the Ukraine with the Ukrainians in this conflict. It is then a Russian invasion, uh, the invasion of the Bolsheviks and the invasion of the White Army that upsets this multinational dream that the Ukrainian intellectuals who were governing hope to bring about. So it seems to me that you you are making in the book and you just made here an important argument when you say that it's not age old antisemitism that brought in the violence against the Jews, but it was the historical circumstances, specific circumstances in which perpetrator used symbols that were age old. Correct. And I of course identify with this argument because that's the argument I try to make in in, in, in my book. And I think it is an important argument because of course we, we know there is a distinguished argument in, um, in the history of antisemitism and of the Holocaust that says that it's age old antisemitism that, um, that goes on and on and on and then it bursts 
in the Holocaust in, um, and, and I think this is one of the contributions of, of your book, this that to uh, pinpoint is a specific historical moment in which this um, violence erupted while using, of course, symbols and metaphors and images that are in, in, the, symbolic, uh, in the symbolic manual of anti-Semitism. So Jeffrey, can you tell us a little bit more about who actually were the perpetrators? Yeah. Um, and what were the motivations? You, you about the motivations you somewhat answered, but, but yeah, so that more. question, I mean, as you point out, that question follows upon the question that you just asked. Yes. Um, and about the motivations. Right. So there's a wide variety of different motivations for the pogrom perpetrators and Jews are targeted for a wide variety of reasons. But to think of one of the common ones, as I said, Jews tended to live in ethnic enclaves. So if you can, or sorry, in urban enclaves. So if you can imagine a typical Ukrainian town or a typical town in Ukraine at the time uh, would have the center of town would be a marketplace and there would be Jewish stores all around the center of town. Jews tended to be artisans, tailors, blacksmiths, glassmakers, uh, coopers. Those were the traditional Jewish occupations that they served. And they also tended to be the store owners and they lived in the center of town. And then out from the center of town, you would get the peasant lands and the peasant farmland, which was predominantly ethnic Ukrainians and Christ Christian ethnic Ukrainians. The pogroms began in 1918, 1919, after this region had seen four years of extreme warfare of the type of total war uh, of the First World War, much of which was fought on Ukrainian land and land that had been pretty poor previously and was further um, was you know further made poor as a result of the war and crops weren't coming out because tanks or not tanks but uh, soldiers had been roaming over them uh, it was just a mess and people were starving and soldiers were starving and the armies couldn't feed their soldiers uh, in many cases these were armies that had just been established weeks before. Uh, the Ukrainian state is established right at the very end of 1918. The first pogroms are taking place weeks later. Mm -hmm. So it's an army that hasn't properly been trained. It's just soldiers, you know, demobilized soldiers from other armies who are brought over, bringing with them their old uniforms. It's just total chaos. And they're legitimately hungry. And they're going from town to town. They get into the town and there are the Jewish stores. So the army decides that they are going to requisition themselves by taking from the stores that exist. So they go into the center of town, they raid the stores, and they take all the foods. They take the grain that's in the store, they take the produce that's in the store, they take the liquor that's in the store, and you know, use it to feed the army. So you can read in reports, in reports that the military puts out, saying we requisitioned 250 pairs of shoes from the Jewish shoemaker in town. And that is, you know, these requisitions, what the army is interpreting as requisitions or what the Jews are interpreting as a pogrom. From their perspective, what happened was the army came into town, they raided their stores, they took all of their property, they often beat them up and sometimes killed them in the, in the process of taking their property, and they left. So some of these pogroms, and certainly in the early days of the pogroms, they are requisitions that can also be viewed as pogroms, because what's the difference? And many of Ask these are- quick question here, Jeffrey. So did, did the soldiers take only the things of the, from, from Jewish stores? Because it stands to reason that they just came into town, they took whatever they want from Gentile stores and from, from Jewish stores. Well, in many of these towns, about 90%, even 100% of the stores in the downtown center are owned by Jews. Uh, and I think that's, you know, hard for us to envision was, you know, hard for me to recognize the extent to which that's the case. But if you look at the statistics, um, you can see in, in Tulchi, in the town that I mentioned, for instance, 97% of the clothing stores and of the tailors were owned by Jews and were Jewish. Uh, so these really the downtown core was Jewish. And to many people who lived in the area, they just associated the two and they didn't even, you know, to them, a Jew was a store owner that they would use the term, you know, I got to go to the Jew to turn in my, you know, to, to sell my grain. Um, so these socio, the socioeconomic role that Jews were serving in Ukraine 
uh, was very distinct. And it was that socioeconomic role that was particularly targeted. It's not to say all Jews were store owners and not all store owners were Jews, but the, a very large proportion of them were. And sometimes the few Christian stores, Christian owned stores that did exist would put up a cross and would be avoided as a result. But it wasn't very hard to avoid the three or four Christian stores and just target uh, the Jewish stores. So this was at the beginning yeah. of the pogrom. Yes. But then you, you describe in the book that actually a new set of, of uh, perpetrators came into the state into, into the four. Right. So this is the first, this is the beginning, and this is the many of the pogroms take this form. Uh, but then there are other military units and particular military units that essentially go rogue. And the local commander uh, decides that he's going, they're on a mission to rout out Bolsheviks, is really what their job is. These Ukrainian military units are trying to rout out Bolsheviks or root out Bolsheviks in the, in the town. And they come in and they interpret Bolsheviks to mean Jews. And so they go and they round up all of the Jews in the synagogue, for instance, and say that we've now got all the Bolsheviks and they go and they kill the Bolsheviks, who they, they're claiming are the Bolsheviks, but really are the Jews. Um, they make no distinction between Jews and Bolsheviks. And this is a result of extensive propaganda that tries to portray Jews as Bolsheviks. And all the militaries, all the anti-Bolshevik militaries are doing this. They're all accusing Jews of being Bolshevik. Uh, the Russian military does it, the Polish military does it, and the Ukrainian military does it. And it's a result of extensive propaganda. And the reason that we have this propaganda associating Jews and Bolsheviks is, well, what the Bolsheviks are promising is something that a lot of people actually want. The Bolsheviks are promising land, bread, and peace. And if you are a typical peasant, you want land, you want bread, and you want peace. So if you are the, a member of the old Russian imperial elite, and you want to convince the peasants to be on your side and not on the side of the Bolsheviks, the only way you can do that is by saying, listen, these promises of land, bread, and peace, they're not real. The Bolsheviks are just Jews. They're, it's a ploy by the Jews to convince you uh, to go onto their side. And then this is where it draws upon traditional anti-Semitism. And then the peasants say, oh yeah, you can never trust a Jew and they're already primed to mistrust the Jews. So this allows them to come over to the side of the Russian imperialists. And that's why you have poor peasants fighting for aristocratic military uh, imperialists instead of for the Bolsheviks who are promising them land, bread and peace. So this association sticks. And in fact, the white army, the old Russian imperial army, puts out propaganda posters. I have one that I use in the book of uh, it's Trotsky basically leading Christ to the cross. So taking the ancient myth that it is Jews who crucified Christ and making it seem like it's the Bolsheviks who crucified Christ by associating those two. So reminding people of what the Jews had done to Christ and saying that now the Bolsheviks are doing that as well. So this association between Jews and Bolsheviks became very powerful. And it was a very effective way of discrediting the Bolsheviks in the minds of ordinary people. I'd like us to talk also about the implications of the programs in the years after. But before, I want to ask you two questions. So the, the first is about the title of the book, In the Midst of Civilized Europe, which is taken from a quote by Anatole France from 1919. But I want to ask you, how do you feel about this, <laughs> this title? Because, because it, it assumes that we are surprised that in the midst of uh, civilized Europe, uh, something like this happens. But we are historians, even if you are not a historian, you don't think that uh, Europe uh, has been so civilized in its uh, long history. And what about colonialism and, and, uh, and, and the Holocaust? and, and and, yeah. and, we, and, and I'm not going to, to elaborate now all the uncivilized things that Europeans have done. So why, why did you choose this uh, title? Yeah, so you are correct, of course, the European, you know, the myth of European civilization is just that, a myth. 
Um, that being said, I think a lot of people do think that this 1919 period in particular was a period of great peace and hope. It's when H.G. Wells talked about the war as the war that will end all wars. It's you know the formation of the League of Nations, the Paris Peace Treaties. Uh, many people really believed that this was the start of a new civilization, particularly that period, 1918 to 1921, until it all started to fall apart. Um, that was, a, it really was, and you see it in art, you see it in, uh, in writings, that it was a period of great hope, um, misguided hope, of course, as hope often is, um, but it was, a period of, it was a period of great hope, and particularly in Ukraine, um, I think, and where this idea of a Ukrainian multinational state was being established, and the Bolsheviks also were projecting hope and imagining you know, a great future before them. So there was this moment, and I wanted to try to get at that this happens in the midst of a moment of great hope that's destroyed by violence. I, I thought that that's what you say, and it's convincing, but I prefer to read it in an ironic mode. Yeah, it's also ironic. <laughs> oh, that's also uh, true. Okay. My other question is about your method with testimonies with oral testimonies. And, and one reason I'm asking it is you, you may know that there is a, a renewed debate among, uh, among scholars of Zionism, of Palestine, uh, Israeli scholars about the validity of uh, Palestinian testimonies with respect to 1948 and Nakba, that some, uh, some historians, they are uh, Jews, they are uh, Zionists, said that there, there is no validity to oral history testimony unless you can, uh, un unless there are also written sources. Palestinian historians say that there are no written Palestinian sources for the Nakba, for the expulsion of the Palestinians in 1948. You have to use uh, oral history. Same Jewish historians who uh, refute the validity of Palestinian uh, oral history, of course, except without question the validity of, of Holocaust uh, te testimonies. Um, so one of the striking, I think, achievement of, of the book is the, the amount of testimonies. First, that the Jews during and immediately after the pogroms collected and that, that you use. So I was wondering if you can tell us what is your view about the method of oral history? How did you use it? If you believed your sources, of course, historians are not supposed to believe anyone, uh, any source. Um, if you double check them, uh, how, how did you go about it? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, the oral history, my previous book was really based on oral histories where I was the person asking the questions or me and my colleagues were the persons asking the questions. And those were histories taken 80, 90 years after the event. Uh, and the inspiration for the book was those few interviews that we took 90 years after the event. Um, the person who showed me the scar that I talked about, um, for instance, uh, there he had a scar. So I tend to believe at least part of the story. Uh, and those Testimonies, really what they tell you is what people think about what they thought of the events at the time. Um, that's important as well. They don't always remember the details, particularly 90, 80 years after the, the fact. So that's a different matter. Um, the testimonies that I used in this book, uh, which was based overwhelmingly on witness testimonies, were taken much closer to the events that they described and were also taken for particular reasons. Uh, there are several different waves of testimonies that I use. The first were lawyers in the immediate aftermath of the pogrom, sometimes in the days after or even the weeks after, would go into these towns in which a pogrom had been perpetrated and would take testimonies from person after person after person, go door to door, knocking on doors, asking people what they experienced during the pogrom. And so these are near contemporaneous testimonies. And a lot of the testimonies focus on loss of property because they are hoping that they're going to get restitution for the property that was lost. Uh, so they're quite specific in those terms. But I think they do tell, you know, when they say that my husband was killed, that seems to be, that seems to be accurate. I mean, they were taken by lawyers 
uh, afterwards, that the whole thing may have been lying, everybody may have been, you know, it could be part of a whole of a whole plot. And in fact, that's what some nationalists say is that this whole thing was made up. But I don't see why in town after town, testimony after testimony, there's tens of thousands of these testimonies that were taken. Uh, and I don't think that they would all be, um, there's enough similarity in them. Then they also often identify insignia on the soldiers uh, who came to the house. They don't know exactly who the soldier is. They don't know what's happening. And they'll describe exactly what the soldier was wearing. And I'm able to go into other sources and determine that this person then was a member of this military and that this military was in that town on this day. So there are elements that you can actually verify. Uh, so that's one side of the testimonies. And then there's a whole nother wave of testimonies that was taken around about 1921. So a couple of years after many of the pogroms. And this is when the Soviet government came into power. The Soviets actually prosecuted pogrom perpetrators. And so they took another wave of testimonies in order to prosecute the perpetrators. And these were new testimonies taken in 1921. You can compare them with the testimonies taken in 1919 and see that they're similar. Then there's yet another wave of testimonies taken by migrants who fled predominantly to Warsaw and then to Berlin. And the Joint Distribution Committee then took testimonies from refugees uh, of the pogroms. And you can see that those are also similar, although there are sometimes differences as well, between the testimonies taken in Warsaw and the testimonies about the same place taken more locally. And then finally, there's yet another wave of testimonies in 1926 after Simon Petlura, the head of the Ukrainian state, is assassinated um, by a vigilante uh, Jew in Paris. And there's a trial of Sholem Schwarzbart, who is the Jew who assassinated Petlura, and that brings about a whole nother round of testimonies. So there's multiple waves of testimonies, often in the same town, and you can compare them over time. Uh, there's also diaries and chronicles, you know, more extensively written chronicles and accounts. And we can take those and compare them to the testimonies as well and see the similarities. So there are other sources that you can use to what I call triangulate them, you know, to take several different sources, um, a testimony, maybe a map, you know, somebody will mention something that happened in a particular store. I can then go to this city guide from that year and see that, oh, the store does exist. It is where he said it was. Um, it, you know, sold what this person said it sold, and the soldiers that he claims perpetrated atrocities were in the town on that day. Uh, and that's, is, you know, as good as we can get. It works in trial, you know, in the, in the in courts today, they say that, you know, unless you have eyewitness testimony, it's very difficult to prove a case. And uh, I think it's very convincing, Jeffrey. And much as it is conv convincing for the Holocaust, it is convincing for other historical cases, including the Palestinian testimonies for 1948. Um, and, and, and as you say, if someone thinks that it's all a hoax, well, he or she needs to explain how is it that so many tes uh, testimonies got together and, uh, and yeah. created this, this uh, fantasy story. So, I still have three questions, maybe two. So maybe you'll answer them rather briefly. So we'll have time for uh, a few questions. So, so what was the memory of this foundational pogrom in the years, in the interyear wars? Clearly now the Holocaust of a sh shadows uh, everything, but, but the Holocaust in the Ukraine in this area started in 1939 or 1941. So has this event really been in the collective memory yeah. between 1919 to 1939, say? Yeah, so yes. Yeah. So it's so only I, with hindsight that we are reconstructing it. Right, so that's you know a question that I wondered immediately is, you know, why, when I recognized what had happened, why were people not talking about this? And I was curious what they were saying in the interwar period. So I went to look at some Jewish newspapers, Jewish writings, and started to recognize that in many ways, I mean, it's really all anybody was talking about, that mm. the amount of literature that deals with pogroms, and Harriet Morav, uh, University of Illinois, is right now writing a fantastic book about literature of pogroms. 
uh, the amount of literature, the amount of artwork that was being produced about pogroms, um, political maneuvering that was taking place in reference to pogroms. Jewish representatives went to the Paris peace treaties and, try, and negotiated for minority rights for Jews in Poland and Ukraine on the basis of the pogroms. Uh, the pogroms were in the front page of the New York Times repeatedly. There were massive rallies throughout the United States in defense of uh, Jewish victims of the pogroms. So it was by no means a secret that this was going on in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, what happened is, you know, after 1933 and after the Holocaust, it receded into the background. But for about 15 years before Hitler's rise to power, uh, it was very much on everybody's mind. And we subsequently um, had forgotten about it. There were collections of documents, there were museum exhibitions uh, in the Soviet Union about the pogroms. Uh, Elisa Bemporat has written a fantastic book also about the memory of the pogroms in the Soviet Union. Uh, so people knew about it in the interwar period uh, and, uh, and recognized their importance. Jeffrey, final question. What was the, what were the implications of these pogroms for Jews and for non for non Jews, um, such as immigration or yeah. other things in the bloodlands themselves? Yeah. So you know, the last quarter of my book really deals with the implications and the aftermath, and th this I think also relates in some ways uh, to the causal relationship to the Holocaust. Um, one thing that happened was Jews started to identify more and more themselves with the Bolsheviks. Uh, they did this because the Bolsheviks started to put an end to pogroms and they started to, and the Red Army started to crack down on pogroms. So Jews started to join the Red Army in greater numbers, thereby furthering that association between Jews and Bolsheviks. Um, basically, you know, all of these different armies would pass through a town and they would round up the Jews and they would kill them. The Red Army would come to town and they would round up the Jews and they would say to the Jews, we've saved you. And now we ask you to join us and to come save the Jews in the next village over. And a lot of Jewish men listened and they joined the Red Army and then went to the next town to try to liberate it. And then Jews also joined the Soviet Union uh, in prosecuting pogrom perpetrators and joined the extraordinary commissions that Cheka uh, in the aftermath in order to prosecute pogrom perpetrators. So that was one aftermath, creating a further association between Jews and Bolsheviks. Many other Jews, in fact, three to 500,000, fled the region entirely and fled predominantly into Germany uh, is where most of them ended up. And I also think that this is an underestimated factor in the rise of Nazism is the role of these refugees. There was a great fear um, in Berlin, particularly in far right circles, about all of these refugees from Bolshevism, these poverty stricken um, pogrom victim refugees of Bolshevism who were coming into certain quarters of Berlin. And they feared that they were bringing Bolshevism with them. Didn't matter that they were people fleeing Bolsheviks, but there was this fear that the new refugees were importing Bolshevism. And this was a big factor in the rise of right wing movements. Uh, in Germany, including Hitler's own rise. Um, people have written about that. Michael Brenner has a great new book about that. And, you know, it's not entirely new, but I think it's something that we have underestimated is the role of this refugee crisis uh, played in the rise of Nazism, particularly in that early period of 1919 to 1923. Um, so I think those are some of the main impacts. Uh, uh, and then in the towns itself, there is a feeling of, there's a feeling of guilt um, among many of the perpetrators of the pogroms. Uh, often they were young people, young soldiers, or even you know, teenagers, local teenagers, who came into the towns to harass the Jews. And they now grow up, they're in their 20s and 30s, and there's this feeling of tension uh, in many villages, um, a recognition that they had done something terrible 10, 15 years earlier. And when the Germans invade, it gives them the opportunity to absolve themselves of that, to have an even greater crime take place that will erase all memory of what they had done. Uh, and I think in many ways, that's what happened. Okay, we have many questions. We will not be able to get to all of them, but let me at least, um, let's hope that we can have a few of them. So Jürgen Mateus find your argument regarding multi-causality and the importance of post-World War I anti-Jewish violence, very convincing. 
given the regional and local context of this 1919 violence, can you say a bit more about the transmission mechanism between this violence and the one brought to the region by the Wehrmacht in the Second World War? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, the Wehrmacht unleashes, or the Germans in general, you know, unleash this latent violence again. And as I said, they do so very explicitly in Ukraine, uh, even calling it Petlura days. And they say, you know, this is that they say to the local population, now is your opportunity to take your revenge against the Jews for what they did to you in 1919, 1921, to take your revenge for what they did to Petlura. Uh, for, you know, so they very, the Germans are very much intentionally framing it in motivating the local population as a rebellion against communism. That being said, there are also atrocities that take place in areas in which pogroms did not take place. Uh, there are the local population participates in pogroms in Lithuania, uh, in Latvia, uh, as well as in you know individual towns in Ukraine in which pogroms didn't take place. And you know a lot of people have pointed that out as a critique of the work. And to me, it just doesn't. Say, I'm not arguing that it has to be so localized. It was the general knowledge that was widespread throughout Europe, that this was now possible, that the idea of actually exterminating entire Jewish populations was possible because in some towns it had been done. Uh, in some towns, there had been as many as three to 5,000 Jews who were killed uh, in these pogroms from 1919 to 1921. And you don't have to be from that town to recognize that possibility um, in another town. So I think that's the, a lot of it is those mechanisms. There's also still stolen property. Much of the pogroms were about stolen property. In 1939, uh, in 1941, people still have the property that they stole in 1921. So those mechanisms are still in place. Many of the perpetrators of the 1941 pogroms may have been wearing boots that they stole in 1921 from the Jewish shops or from individual Jews. So it's such a short time that you don't even need memory of the physical objects that uh, uh, you know that continue to impact. Shoshana Bari is asking about the role of the Zionist movement in this, and she wonders whether the Zionist organization and historians have silenced these pogroms. Because when we say that it was silenced, we should also ask silence by whom. Jews mm -hmm. are very good in uh, reminding themselves and others of their misfortunes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't think they were intentionally silenced. I think they receded into the background because of the prominence of the Holocaust and, and uh, also because of the closure of the Soviet Union and the difficulties of speaking to people in the Soviet Union. Um, for all those reasons, I think they receded in importance. After the Holocaust, there was a, such a concentration on the fate of Jews in Poland, the fate of Jews in Germany, uh, in which the pogroms are not a direct history. Uh, so I think it's for other reasons rather than intentional silencing. What about the years between 1919 to 1939? Um, what about the years between... I, why yeah, well, how, how did the Zionist movement regard this... Oh. Um, yeah, Especially because, if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I think so. Most of the most of the immigrants immigrated to, to America or wanted to immigrate to yeah. America. Not yeah, to though Palestine. many of the refugees do end up in Palestine. At least some of the refugees end up in Palestine between 1919 and 1939. And there you can see, I mean, Jabotinsky, who's not exactly a, uh, a victim of the pogroms, but certainly knows about them and is very involved in the fight against them, interprets what's going on in Palestine through the prism of the pogroms. And you see this in the language that they use when they talk about the, uh, they use the same terminology of pogroms, the pogrom, the Jaffa pogrom of 1921, for instance, which is very much not a pogrom, um, but yet uh, many of the Zionists view it through the eyes of what they had experienced uh, in Ukraine. So there's somewhat of that importation of the Ukrainian experience to Palestine uh, that I think is misguided but you can see how it's still on their minds and they're still thinking in those terms. They're thinking in Eastern European terms when the situation actually is quite different. Shoshana also mentions the Nardau plan of 1920 um, about the pogroms. And then 
Mm-hmm. The, the Morgenthau report of 1919 and its influence on the League of Nations. Are these, are these connected? Yeah, so, you know, there's, Morgenthau goes to study the pogroms and concludes that they were overstated. Um, he does this in 1919, before the worst of the pogroms have taken place. Mm-hmm. And his commission, he is very hostile to Zionism already. Um, his commission goes to Warsaw, to Vilnius, I uh, can't remember where else. Uh, I'm blanking on where else at the moment. But he goes to a few towns in Poland, does an investigation, sees that a few hundred people were killed. But these rumors of thousands aren't accurate. But the reason is because he mistakenly thinks that the pogroms are actually being perpetrated in Poland, uh, where some were, but the worst of them were in Ukraine. And it wasn't possible to get to Ukraine at the time because of the war. Uh, And the United States didn't have diplomatic relations with any organization that was ruling Ukraine at the time. So it wasn't possible for American aid workers to get to Ukraine to see what was really going on. So Morgenthau went, went to Poland, and concluded that they were exaggerated. But he missed the real story, which was further to the east. And in fact, a lot of Jews spoke about the pogroms as Polish pogroms rather than Ukrainian pogroms as well, um, perpetuating that uh, misconception. And the reason is because Poland had a state. They could use the pogroms to, uh, to get concessions from the Polish government whereas they still hoped that the Ukrainian government was gonna be revived as a multinational government that would give them rights. And many of them didn't want to embarrass the Ukrainian government by letting it be known that they were perpetrating pogroms as well. Um, And there was also just general confusion over what's Poland, what's Ukraine, it's contested territory. uh, And yeah, people were were confused by that. And Morgenthau fell into that confusion. Jeffrey, Andy Donson asked a question that again brings the the comparative aspect. He says, was the violence against the Jews between 1918 to 1921 more extreme than the violence against other ethnic and political groups in these years? And I would add to it, do we have other uh, comprehensive uh, books and researchers about about violence against ethnic, against against other ethnic and political groups. You know, Mennonites are also targeted in Ukraine. Uh, there simply aren't as many of them, uh, and they're not as widespread. So I think you know it's difficult to compare violence. There, you know, more Jews may be killed because there are more Jews. Um, Jews are more widespread, so they may be killed in more places. There's a, there's a lot of violence, but there's also a lot of concentration on Jews. So I don't really want to get into the comparisons. It's terrible when any civilian is killed. Uh, but there is a particular obsession already that we see among all parties to this conflict against the Jews um, that you don't see against other groups, um, even against the Mennonites, uh, who are also victims of genocide at the time. So... I'm interested to ask you, following what you said before about the uh, practice of um, of getting testimonies after the 1919 pogroms, w- whether these practices uh, influenced the practices of assembling Holocaust testimonies after 1945, perhaps sometimes whether there were sometimes the same people or people who consulted what had been done 20 years earlier, or not at all? Yeah, no, I definitely think there is a connection. In the same way that there is a connection between the perpetrator's actions, there's also a connection between the victim's responses. And Jews had learned how to respond to violence. They learned in 1919 also, from 1903 to 1905, how to collect testimonies, and each wave Uh, they got a little bit better at it and got more comprehensive at it. But yes, this need to record everything, um, the knowledge of how to record it was learned over time. And Jews became very effective at it precisely because they had done it so many times. Uh, So yes, it's another connection with the Holocaust for sure. Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you, what have uh, surprised you, if any, in the research? You know, oftentimes when we do uh, multi-year research and write a long book uh, 
we look back and we say, wow, this I didn't expect, or actually, no, I expected everything. Um, um, we historians, we are good in predicting the past. So did you predict uh, the past of your uh, research? What, um, what surprised you? Yeah, I think the level of violence, the extent to which it was recorded, the amount of information that's available, the tens of thousands of testimonies that are available, um, surprised me. I didn't, I thought I would be able to write about this in a chapter of a larger book, as I said, um, but just the amount of, the amount of recording that was done uh, astounded me. And then the strength of the association between Jews and Bolsheviks uh, also astounded me, uh, which I knew before as well, but hadn't quite recognized how motivating it was for all of the groups involved and the role that it served in discrediting Bolshevism by ascribing it to the Jews, how instrumental that was. Uh, and we now recognize more and more the role that that played in the Holocaust as well. Um, there have been a lot of books uh, that have pointed that out, that at least in the East, um, the motivation for the Holocaust was less racially motivated and more politically mo motivated, more motivated by the uh, false notion that Jews and Bolsheviks can be equated. The, the hardcover of your book has, has, a, has a photograph of um, a few young survivors. Uh, Stuart Liebman is asking whether or not films and extensive photographic records made and disseminated in reports in the West I would add also in the East. Mm -hmm. uh, did not Jewish groups use these vivid forms of testimony and how influential were they? Yeah, yeah, very much so. There were a lot of photographs and I don't use many in my book because they're atrocity photographs. And I think I, think I have one and that's enough. Um, but there were a lot of photographs that were widely distributed of victims of pogroms and they were distributed in order to solicit aid. Um, by the way, the cover of the book is, uh, it has two different covers. So the US cover does not have that picture on it. Uh, the uh, UK cover does have that picture on it. Okay. Um, why is that? Yeah, why is why, that? Yeah, yeah. Why, why did the US decide to be? Different, different publishers. Actually, the, the US version, I was more involved in the US version because that was my editor, Metropolitan Books. Um, and I will say, while well, we're on the topic, that Metropolitan Books has for about 30 years or so, been publishing outstanding uh, books on very serious subjects like the pogroms of Ukraine. And as of last week was closed by Henry Holt. Um, so the book publisher is at this moment being closed. And I think that's a real tragedy uh, for book publishing uh, in the United States. But I had more say in the, Ameri in the American version. Initially, they had a photo like that of uh, victims of pogroms, and I felt it was too static and too uh, too morose. Whereas I wanted a cover that would get at some of the excitement that I used that title for, um, some of the optimism that people felt in 1919, uh, and that would get at the movement, the feeling of movement and progress. And so the graphic designers designed the cover um, that exists, uh, which I which I think is nice. It's also uh, it's come out in German, in Dutch, and in Spanish, and each of them have picked a different color cover too. I had absolutely no say in the German, the Spanish, and the uh, Dutch uh, covers, um, but I think they're also very good. So it's just been interesting for me to see what these artists do with the book um, without me having any input in it. So, Okay, thank you, Jeffrey, for no, this conversation. I'd like to thank, thank Amos as well. Thank you. And to our audience, of course, thank you and uh, see you in our next event. Bye. Thank you very much. And Shana Tova. Shana Tova.